there are several handouts that I, I gave you today. One, you may have already made a copy of this, but I thought I'd be sure and, and give you one of these because well, let's talk about it now. Um, let's see, for the benefit of the video. You'll notice that in this periodic table that some of the elements have red boxes around them. Those are the ones I want you to memorize. What do those symbols mean? What element is that symbol? If you haven't already done it at some previous time, um, best way is to make flashcards. Just get a set of three by fives and write the symbol on one side, the name on the other. Notice there are no names in here, so you have to look them up. Just in the front cover of your book, you'll find an alphabetical list of symbols and names. Match them up, make your flashcards, and then just memorize the symbols. There should be about 60 of them. There are 118 <laughs> elements in the periodic table, and I only have you memorize 60. So I think I'm a good person. <clears throat> but those are the ones you're going to need to learn the language of chemistry. This is the alphabet. You don't have to memorize the atomic numbers, the atomic weights, or any of the charges or anything, just the symbols. The periodic table is there, so you don't have to memorize those other things. You, you need to know the symbols so you know where you're going. If somebody says uh, oxygen, you know to go right here. There's O. And you can find out a lot of stuff you need to know about that. Also, by the time we finish this course, you should know more about the structure of the periodic table. Why is it laid out this way? It, there's a, there are patterns in here that will help you uh, at some point actually draw the electronic configuration of an atom based on where it is in the table. Um, oh, and also pay attention to these ones with the blue squares on them. Those are diatomic elements. Whenever, if a word problem says oxygen reacts with hydrogen, you know that you don't write, you don't write that, react with that. That's wrong. They're always diatomic for our purposes. Uh, we're not in extreme conditions at room temperature and pressure. They're going to be like that and like that. So when the word problem says oxygen and hydrogen, you should think diatomic. And for these others also. Notice hydrogen's up here in the upper left-hand corner. The others form an upside-down L. Like that. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Those are the diatomics. Okay. Let's see. Everybody got a copy of the PowerPoints. And I also uh, give you a copy of the, the lab that we're going to do next week. We'll talk about this a little bit. Uh, this is kind of busy work, but it's, it's good busy work because it familiarizes you with how uh, graphs work. Probably, maybe you've been introduced to this in math already, but um, we're going to port it over into the real world. You know, math is kind of imaginary. And then these last two are extra credits. So in this, I showed you those in the Blackboard, didn't I? Extra credits. Okay, these are hard copies, so you don't have to make your own. And they'll they'll be they'll make more sense as we go along in this first two chapters. Okay, let's see, that's coming through okay. Except it was stupid bit type message. But all right, so let's start a slideshow. All right, got to start someplace. So we're gonna we're gonna build our house on the rocks, not on the sand, so to speak. Chemical foundations. Um, can, defining chemistry is a good place to start. What what is chemistry? It's the study of this is a really broad definition substances and how one substance changes into another. Okay, that's, we make it broad so that we can slide just about anything we want to into it. Um, the, really the intuitive part, the part that you want to develop over time is a feel for uh, relating what you can see, hear, touch, whatever, the macroscopic world and what's going on underneath. 
to the microscopic world because that's where the chemistry happens where you can't see it <clears throat> and the connection between those two worlds is vital to really gaining a, a proficiency a comfort yeah be sure and sign in a comfort with chemistry and the more comfortable you are with it the less anxiety you'll have if you don't already have a lot of anxiety um, well, that's good. If you're already comfortable, fine. If you're not comfortable, then that's what we're aiming for. Comfort with the subject. Because when times get stressful, then you want to be able to perform. For instance, during exams. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna learn the atomic level and try to relate it to what we see and hear, and touch, and feel. That's redundant though, touch and feel. Okay, so what happens on the uh, microscopic level has to do with uh, atoms and molecules. Right? An atom is the smallest unit of matter that retains the identity of the element for which it's named. So if you take a, a chunk of gold, let's be rich, and you keep subdividing it, Cut it in half, cut it in half, cut it in half. Eventually, you get down to the last cut, gives you something that you can't cut anymore. And that is the atom. All right? This is the Greek, Greek prefix that means not. And this is the Greek root word that says cut or divide. So that's why the atom is called that. You can't cut it anymore. Can't make it any smaller. <clears throat> and that's the, the smallest unit of an element. Um, now, you can combine these elements, and that's very often how you find them in nature. Combined. Rarely do you find an element that's not combined with something, except maybe the air you breathe. Right? <laughs> Oxygen's not combined, it's mixed with nitrogen primarily, and then some other gases. But uh, these are individual atoms, and if they combine in such a way that they uh, now have a different identity, they behave differently. This is a gas when it's O2, this is a gas when it's H2. And when you combine them in a ratio of one atom of oxygen and two atoms of hydrogen, you get water. And it's nothing like oxygen. It's nothing like hydrogen. Oxygen supports life or it supports uh, combustion. Hydrogen is flammable. I just ask anybody that's watched the space shuttle go up or one of these newer rockets that has hydrogen as fuel and, and the oxidizer is liquid oxygen. They use that because it has a lot of power. <clears throat> but these are gases at room temperature and pressure. But that's not, that's a liquid. So it has a different identity, but it's made from, you know, those atoms. We've undergone a chemical change and produced molecules. Molecules are combinations of uh, different, actually, they don't have to be different. Molecules can be a combination of two or more atoms, such a way that they behave as a single unit. And we'll, we'll investigate why that is later. This is just introductory material. So oxygen will be, that's a molecule also. It's not an atom because there are two atoms there. And that's a molecule of hydrogen. Uh, oh, notice that uh, this is how we say there are two of them there. It's a subscript. In fact, we, we might see a slide about this later, but this is a good time to bring it up. Whenever we write the symbol for an element, and this is, that's my generic element, because it's, there's no element in the periodic table that has an X. That's just an X. We've got an XE right here. So this is my generic symbol. There are four positions around that symbol that are reserved for certain information. Right? Up here in the right-hand chart, side is, uh, upper right-hand is charge. Right? If your atom acquires a charge, a positive or negative charge, and you say how much, either 
either uh, plus or two plus or three plus or minus or two minus, it goes in that position. If uh, in either standing alone or in a compound, you need to know how many of them there are. That's what this is. This is numbers of that atom. Over here, we have the, and it's designated with a Z, this is the atomic number. And we'll talk about what that is and what it means. And this is the mass number. Okay, so those positions are reserved for information. And anybody who's, who's had training will know if they see a symbol with information in any one of these spots, they know what it means. Okay. What does that other one mean? I'm sorry. This one? Oh, mass number. Nope. Atomic Another number. <laughs> I'll just go ahead and say it. Okay. This is the number of protons. Even though we haven't introduced that topic yet, most people know what a proton is. And this is the mass number, which is the summation of the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. That's what all that's for. So when we have a chemical reaction, there's a, a chemical change takes place. We produce a substance with a different identity, at least one substance, sometimes many more. But in this case, we have these two. Actually, we're going backwards. Excuse me, I uh, misspoke. Now we have water, and we're going to split it apart. Right? Before, we were reacting oxygen and hydrogen to make the water. Now we're going to go backwards. We just put some electrical energy in here and it breaks those bonds. And these two oxygens recombine into that diatomic, and these four combine into two hydrogens, hydrogen molecules, okay? All it takes is a little direct current and um, maybe a little bit of acid in there so it'd be conducting. Most people don't realize that pure water, perfectly pure, 100% water, nothing else, is an insulator. <clears throat> Unless, of course, you get enough voltage going through it, <laughs> it will ionize the water, and then you got a free path. And it's... So that's why you don't um, have an electric heater or a transistor radio or something sitting next to your tub. And if it falls in, there's enough voltage there that it will fry you. In fact, in high school, a friend that's, well, she wasn't really a friend, she was a classmate. Um, had gone to their their family's cabin up in the mountains of Georgia, and she was taking a bath during a thunderstorm. She was on the phone in the bathtub. Lightning struck the wire, came right down through the phone through her, and she was gone. So, under normal circumstances, low voltage water is an insulator. But I digress again. Okay, what do we mean by science? The popular media call science whatever they want it to mean, right? If it suits their agenda, they call it science. Or if you don't want to get vaccinated, you're anti-science. Like if you ask them what science is, they really won't have a definition for it because they don't know. Just use that as a club against their enemies. But science is from the root word, uh, the Greek root word that can mean either knowledge or truth, right? Since this is not a philosophy or religion course, we'll settle for knowledge. So science is knowledge and how to organize it. Because if I hadn't said it before, nature just does what it does. Right? It could care less whether we were here or not. Nature does what it does, and our job as scientists is to figure out how it does it and why it does it. So, in other words, nature doesn't care. <clears throat> so this is one of the ways that we gain and organize knowledge is through science. And we use uh, a method. Um, it's actually a subdivision of critical thinking, right? The skeptical mind is a good scientific mind. <clears throat> you don't believe something simply about somebody's told you. Somebody tells you that the sky is falling or that the world is, is in imminent threat from global warming. 
and you say, yeah, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. You know, I need some proof. Well, that's the core of science, skeptical mind. Uh, science itself, as it's come to develop over the centuries, is a plan of action. How do we approach a problem in such a way that we can gain knowledge, organize it, and then convince others of our position? Any research paper that you read in a referee journal is trying to convince you of their position. And they're using uh, experimental data to do it. So you have an opportunity to either believe it or not believe it, or take <laughs> their work and duplicate it to see if it actually is true. And uh, that's the core of science. You know, it's never settled. There's no such thing as settled science. There's generally agreed upon science, scientific results that has developed over the years, accumulated, uh, such as uh, Newton's laws of motion. Right? We generally agree, you know, that they're valid. There are three of them, plus the gravitation, law of gravitation. Those four form the core of Newtonian physics. But even now we know that Newtonian physics can't give us all the answers we want, especially since Einstein introduced relativity. We know that when things get very fast or very big, Newtonian physics just falls apart. We know that now. <clears throat> or when things get really small, like on the atomic scale, Newtonian physics doesn't work. Right? Then we have to go to quantum mechanics. We have to use a completely different um, theory to explain what's going on at those levels. Um, so the core of science is it, it challenges your current beliefs or it challenges uh, the beliefs that other people want you to hold. You got to make them prove it or you can prove it to yourself. I remember a case that's been oh, a couple of decades ago. These two scientists out of Colorado State University claimed in a research paper that they had been able to produce cold fusion on the lab bench. Right? At room temperature, they've been able to fuse hydrogen atoms. And just like the sun does at millions of degrees and tons and tons of pressure. <laughs> okay, so uh, they convinced some editor <laughs> to, to print their bunk, which it turned out to be. And then naturally, other scientists say, all right, we're going to try to duplicate your work. Couldn't do it. So one bright scientist set about the task of finding out, well, if they got these results and they, they argued that the neutron flux that was coming from their device was evidence of fusion. So this other scientist and his team duplicated the experiment and they went to greater pains to uh, measure the various inputs into the system. And they found that that neutron flux was not coming from the reaction. Right? It, was, it was spurious external. So those guys uh, lost their jobs and their careers. Well, that can happen. Uh, either if you're just a, a fool publishing stupid papers, or if you're a cheat and you're just lying about your research, then you can lose your job and, and career there too. I've seen that happen. So scientists are skeptical and they're always looking over your shoulder to see, just to keep you honest. And that's the whole purpose of the, the way that things are set up now. The scientific method and the review process is to keep everybody honest. We want to build on true knowledge over, over time, you know, not build on the, the witch doctor's recipes. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, this is a generalized approach to uh, gaining knowledge. Um, this one is separated because uh, it produces one type of result. When you, uh, most experimentation starts with an observation. Right? You see something in nature or in the lab or wherever it happens to be, and you're curious about it, right? If I haven't said before, your first best friend, did I tell you this last time? Your first best friend in chemistry is curiosity. You always want to know more. Your second best friend is boredom. 
if you're working all these problems I give you and you get bored working them, certain types of problems, then you probably know the problem and how to work it. So you can move on to something else. So curiosity and boredom are your two best friends. So back to this. Uh, if you make an observation, then you, you speculate on uh, what it is that's actually happening there. This is called a hypothesis. Right? If you see something in nature and you say it's happening because this happened first or that happened uh, and it's going to produce this result. It's a simple statement explaining uh, what you think happened. And you can formulate, just brainstorm and make any kind of hypothesis you want. It can be as wild as you want because eventually you're going to weed them out and settle on the one that explains what's going on. And then you uh, devise an experiment to test it. Now, these experiments can be in the laboratory, they can be in the greenhouse, in the field, growth chambers. Um, some uh, sciences are more observational. So they just go out and, and look at stuff and take samples like geologists. They just walk around the rocks and beat on the rocks with their hammers. And then they pull out their magnifying glass and maybe a, a bottle of acid or something and, and observe in the field a lot of times. And they work from historical records so that their, their scientific method is, is slanted in that direction. And that's typical for any science. The discipline itself takes the, the core of the scientific method and modifies it to help them answer questions in their own discipline. Uh, okay, so you do this and you perform your experiment and say, all right, did it support my hypothesis? I mean, does it, uh, does this explanation, is it accounted for in that experiment? If it isn't, that's not bad. You just learned one way that it didn't work. So you modify it, you do it again. Make more observations, formulate your hypothesis, experiment. You keep doing that until you settle on uh, a plausible explanation. And then you may even uh, put it in simple words or a mathematical formula, like uh, Newton's first law of motion was what? An object at rest tends to remain at rest, right? Unless acted upon by an external force. Or if it's moving, it tends to move in a straight line unless acted upon by an external force. That's just a, a law in prose. Okay. His second law, though, is a formula. Right. He said that a force acting upon a mass of a given size will produce an acceleration, right. a change in velocity. It'll gradually speed up. So that's what you're doing when you slam your foot on the gas. You're adding a force to the car. It's a certain mass, and it will accelerate. If the force is greater, like with a Maserati, uh, it'll, it'll accelerate faster. Or if you're in a, a VW bug, it'll take its time getting where it's going. But it's, it's a, a mathematical relationship that is stated in the second law. <clears throat> so the laws can come in different forms. Let's see, do I have that? No, I don't. I just have it here. It's just a summary of observations and behaviors. And basically, a law just says, if these are the conditions, this is what happens every time. So if it's a certain amount of mass and it's a force, it will get that every time. It doesn't say anything about why. It doesn't try to propose a reason for its happening. That's where theories come in. All right, so we'll go back. Now, once you've gained some insight in terms of the law, and you don't always have to state the law. You can move right on into theory if you want. But historically, the laws come first. And then the theories explain why the laws work. So you propose a theory. And a theory incorporates um, an explanation of why it works. And we're going to look at one of those later in the semester. It's called the, the kinetic molecular theory of gases. And it, it 
explains why gases behave the way they do. Okay. Um, that's all you need to know for right now. <laughs> we'll get to actually what it is later. But it, it's an explanation of why gases behave the way they do. And the nice thing about a theory is uh, it usually is accompanied with a model. So what's a model? Right? I think of model airplanes, model battleships, you know, model cars. They're not the real thing. They're a representation of the real thing. But you can take them apart, see how they work. You can change things in your model and see how it affects the outcome. So that gives you a predictive quality to your theory that the law doesn't have. Because the law just says this and then that. It doesn't say what happens if you, if you change the law itself. What if I did this? It wouldn't be Newton's second law anymore. Right? It wouldn't be based on anything logical. <clears throat> so, uh, the theory is usually accompanied by a model. <clears throat> and this model allows you to change. Some models are physical models. Some models are mathematical. A lot of the models that I encountered in, in agriculture were mathematical. They were explanations of, of why your graph had this scatter of data points. Um, you had a mathematical model to explain it. And some of them were kind of, they were stretching because the, the points were all over the place. And they said, okay, best fit line is like this, but the dots were everywhere. So those I kind of had, had my doubts about. Anyway, <clears throat> you can also have physical models like um, in organic chemistry, we have these uh, molecular models where you can put atoms together with sticks and see how they are shaped in space. And then you can bring two of them together and say, all right, what if they come like this? What if they approach like that? Um, in the pharmaceutical industry or in biochemistry in general, uh, there's one theory called lock and key, right? It proposes how enzymes and their substrates behave. So this is the substrate that's gonna be, gonna be changed. This is the enzyme that facilitates it. Enzyme is, is a catalyst of sorts. And if it's the right shape, it fits into a slot and causes the reaction to occur faster. <laughs> but if it's the wrong shape, it won't fit. So that you have a, a physical model there on the molecular scale that allows you to predict whether it's going to work or not. <clears throat> okay, so that's laws, hypothesis theory. Now, ultimately, uh, you can make observations that are qualitative, like uh, the sky is blue. <laughs> well, I wonder why is the sky blue? There's an explanation for that, but that's not a, a quantitative measurement. That's not a, a number. It's just an observation, and you can make a general explanation for it. But when we make measurements in, in science, in chemistry in, in our case, you have two parts to it. You have a number, but a number without a unit of measure is, doesn't mean much unless you know where that number came from. There are dimensionless numbers in chemistry that are used, but most of them have units attached to them. So if I walk into a, um, a crowded room and, and get everybody's attention say, hey, I'm 71, they're probably going to think, you don't look 71. They, what does that mean? They just assumed it was my age. But what I meant was I'm 71 inches tall. Okay, I didn't give them the units. In science, that's deadly. If you don't use, if you don't say what the units are, then the numbers, you know, kind of like a one-legged skater. It can happen, but it's you have to make a lot of assumptions to get there. So we need a number and a unit of measure. For instance, like 20 grams. Gram is a measure of mass. And this number and its units tells you you have 20 grams. So if you're familiar with how much a gram weighs, then you have sort of an intuition as to how big that is. 
But more importantly, if it has to go into a calculation, then yeah, you've got quantitative uh, wind behind your sale. Uh, but units of measure don't necessarily have to be single units. They can be combinations, right? Because when you, when you multiply numbers together and there are units there, then the units get multiplied too. Just like, uh, for instance, if you have a, a box like this, right? And you want to say something about the volume. Right? So you've got a distance here, that way. You've got a distance here, this way. What else? Oh, I'm missing this one. You got a distance here. Let's do it that way. Like that. So let's say that each one of those is in inches. So we have uh, A, let's give them numbers. So two inches for A times four inches for B times three inches for C. If you multiply those together, you get the volume, correct? Well, two times four is eight times three is 24. Cubic inches. We had to multiply the units also. And that's what's happened here. This unit of energy, the joule, entered a calculation with a uh, time, a number with the time unit, and multiply them together, and you, the unit that's left over is joule seconds. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind. When you do calculations, the units have to come out correctly also. And that helps you in calculations because if you know the answer that's being asked in the question is a measure of length, and you come out with a, a number that has units of time, like seconds, you know, something went wrong somewhere. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and by the way, whenever you work out a problem of any kind, ask yourself at the end, does this make sense? That, that keep you out of a lot of trouble. I do it all the time. In fact, I do estimations in my head. When I have a calculation to do, I say, well, that's roughly this, and that's roughly that, and that's multiply them together or whatever and come up with some ballpark number. And then I look at the number I came up with with my calculator and say, oh yeah, they're pretty close. Okay, I'm good, let's go. Estimation's a good habit to get into. Okay, so <clears throat> if scientists are gonna communicate with one another about their results of their experiments, we've gotta have agreed upon things. And one of those things is the units that go with the numbers. So if it's mass in this system, the SI system, which is international system, right? But it's, it's derived from the French, right? So they say everything backwards. That's why SI is to the IS. So the fundamental unit of mass is the kilogram. Now, why do we say it's fundamental? That's because somewhere there is a standard mass it's actually a platinum iridium cylinder that they keep in a, in a double bell jar with inert gases in it and it used to be stored in the cave in france they might have brought it up to topside now since we have air conditioning and heating and they can stabilize the temperature but in the cave temperature is the same all year round so that's why they kept it down there but uh this kilogram is a standard mass and if you have a, a, what you think is a standard mass in your laboratory somewhere else in the world, and uh, you need to standardize it against that mass in France, then you send it to them or you take it to them and they compare it to the original. And they say, okay, ours is exactly one kilogram. Yours is 0 0.9999843. There you go. So anytime you, you measure yours, use it to standardize your instruments, you have to make that correction. But that way, everybody's talking the same language. So mass is always like this. Length is always the meter. Let's see, I'm not doing it all the time. Okay, I better get on the stick. Um, I'll just say that mass, the length, meter was originally derived from the distance uh, from the equator to the North Pole through the city of Greenwich. 
actually through the observatory at Greenwich because that's the prime meridian, right? Longitude starts there, that's zero. And anything to the, the left, if you're facing it, west is west longitude. And anything to the east is east longitude. Until you get to the other side, the international date line, and then that's where they meet at 180. But if that distance through Greenwich was the, the starting point, and then you subdivide it until you get some manageable length. And the meter uh, then was established with a platinum meridian alloy in a funny looking bar. Like, um, I don't know, it's sort of like this. Sort of an A shape, I guess. This is a cross section. So that's platinum and iridium alloy. <laughs> and of course they use that because it, it doesn't, doesn't corrode. And uh, a cross section is like that, but then it's uh, a little over a yard long, 39.36 inches. <clears throat> and that's what you would compare your meter to, to, be, to see how close it was, standardize yours. Now, if you have the equipment and the money, you can buy a piece of equipment that will spit out a meter or, or standardize your meter on the spot because it's not based on that uh, bar anymore. It's based on so many wavelengths of a light from a particular element in a laser. So if you have the equipment, you can do it anywhere in the universe. Uh, the second was sort of grandfathered in. That's from astronomical unit. So what we had to do there was we took what, what we thought to be a second and just standardized it. So this is now the second. And we measure it with an atomic clock. And there's several of them scattered around the world. Now, when you think of a clock, you think, oh, something like this or maybe like that. No, these atomic clocks are busy this room. <clears throat> and then temperature, right? We know Fahrenheit, right? We know intuitively what Fahrenheit feels like. Like it's maybe 75 degrees outside. We know what that feels like, or if it's uh, 15 below. I felt that here in the past. Um, but scientists use Celsius. It's a different system of measuring temperature. And the size of the degree in Celsius is exactly the same size of the degree in this system, Kelvin. The difference is, where's the zero point? The zero point for Celsius is the freezing point of pure water, zero degrees. So that means you can have positive values of Celsius and negative values of Celsius. And for some calculations, that is going to wreak havoc you can't use negative numbers in some calculations. So that's, in comes Lord Kelvin. And he took the Celsius and various properties of gases. In fact, thermodynamics was, he was interested in that at the time. And he was studying the, the uh, experts in the field at the time. A couple of them, one of them comes to mind is Sadie Carnot. If you ever <coughs> look at heat engines, look at up heat engines and Carnot. There'll be a Carnot cycle and it'll, it'll show you what's going on. But he was interested in that. And he said, we need a system that gives you all positive numbers. Well, how do you give all positive numbers? Well, your zero point has to be absolute zero. Nothing can be colder than that. So that's what he did. In fact, he took gases, uh, the behavior of gases from uh, Charles law that we'll study later. And if this is volume and this is temperature, um, Charles had demonstrated, right, as temperature goes up, volume goes up, straight line, but it only goes that far. So Kelvin said, okay, we're going to take these gases and go down to zero volume, which we know is impossible, but theoretically. So he just extended this line out to here. This is on the Celsius scale. And he, now he calls that zero. That's as cold as you can get. 
So this is zero K, but it's also minus 273 C, right? But they're all positive values in the Kelvin system. And uh, when we do gas law calculations where temperature is involved, <laughs> you have to convert your temperature to K. You have to, multi you have to insert a positive value. No negative values will work. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, the ampere is just a measure of electric current. It's so many coulombs per second passing a point. Um, we, we might get to that later when we talk about um, when we have electrolytic reactions. Right? So much current running through a reaction will produce uh, maybe plate out so much metal. Right? It'll become uh, obvious to you when we get there. Oops. Uh, then the mole. Oh, we're going to we're going to beat this one to death. <laughs> the mole is simply a number of things. Now there's a sign, there's a, a, a real basis for it. Right? It's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd things. That's a mole. And it's a more convenient unit to use when you're talking about atoms. You know, if you write out uh, a 1.45 times 10 to the 25th atoms, it's kind of hard to deal with. Convert that to moles, and you got a nice little compact number. So, and there are other reasons for the mole that I'll explain later. Uh, this one, we're not going to deal with this one, the candela. So, you can pretty much forget that one, unless you're going into physics. If you're going to go on with physics, then that'll pop up again. Okay, so uh, these fundamental units might not be the right size that you want for your measurements. You may need something larger, like you may need. Uh, if you're talking about distances, you may mean kilometers, especially in astronomy. Uh, in fact, kilometers aren't big enough, right? We're talking in terms of uh, astronomical units, the average distance of the Earth to the sun, or that's in inside the solar system. But if you go out, you may need light years or parsecs, bigger, bigger numbers. So um, these are the multipliers, the prefixes that you would put in front of the fundamental unit to make a bigger or a smaller unit, right? If you needed a unit that was a million times the meter, say, you'd put a big M for megameter, big M, little m, or uh, grams, megagrams. Oh, that begs the question. If the fundamental unit is kilogram, kilo means a thousand. Right? Why is that the fundamental unit? It's already got a prefix in it. Right? I was puzzled about that until it just the light bulb went on. We're trying to maintain a standard over long periods of time. So the mass has to be unchanged for decades and centuries. So if you have a gram of platinum iridium, that's probably a little big, but um, what happens if you get a fingerprint on that or it corrodes just slightly? The percentage error will be massive. But if you use something like this, that size, then a little fingerprint probably won't affect it very much. So that's why they, the gram already existed. Right? So they had to grandfather it in and they needed something bigger. So they called, they called on the kilogram. Okay. Um, but the prefix still means the same thing. Kilogram is a thousand grams. So this is when you want bigger numbers. So just learn those prefixes, like especially kilo and mega. Um, these might be interesting too. Gigas is a, a billion, right? Everybody knows gigabytes, right? Gigabytes, that's a billion bytes. Now we've got terabytes. Right? Even in, in my USB drive, it's a one terabyte drive. <laughs> I got one at home, it's three terabytes. And I got another USB drive 10, no, 14 terabytes. I have lots of video files. <clears throat> but it's it's amazing. The first computer I had, the hard drive was 78 megabytes. It was that big and weighed a ton. So now, I mean, you can get that much on a, on a little thumbnail chip. More than that, actually. Anyway, those are your prefixes. 
that you would use to change the unit of measure. So, uh, for instance, if we say um, the distance between two points is 150 kilometers, what would that be in meters? Well, K means a thousand, right? So it's 150 times a thousand times meters. So it's 150,000 meters. You go backwards and forwards that way. As long as you know what the prefix means. And that's a, a handy skill to develop because uh, when you start doing calculations with these various formulas, some of these formulas are very picky about the units of measure that go into them, especially the universal, uh, the gas law, universal gas law. We'll get to that eventually. Um, it has to have specific units of measure. So you be, need to be able to convert before you use the formula. Otherwise, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And you can make really small numbers too, right? For uh, milli, right? millimeters, everybody's familiar with that, milliliters, um, nano, billionth of nanometers, like the length, a nanometer is the, is the unit of measure for nanofibers that you they put in your exercise leotards or whatever the case may be. It's nanofibers, that's why they're, they're called nanotechnology because they're about that size. Now, on the atomic scale, we're talking uh, pico size, 10 to the minus 12. So you don't want to have to write out all these zeros. And there's another way to get around that, too. I'll show you in a minute, called scientific notation. Um, but I do want to digress one moment and, and make a point of this. Mass and weight are not equivalent. Mass is a measure of substance. And it's related to the inertia, like Newton's first law. The inertia is what makes that thing go in the straight line unless something acts on it. Inertia. That's what keeps um, the plates and silverware and glasses full of water on the table when you yank the tablecloth out from under it. They have inertia. They want to stay put. So if you pull it quick enough, then there's, there's less uh, drag. And a satin cloth will probably work best. Right? If you... You try it with a cotton or a wool cloth, they'll probably stick and you'll have broken glasses everywhere. But mass is a measure of substance and weight is a force, right? But mass and weight are related, right? And they're related by Newton's second law. Right? Force equals mass times acceleration. So if you have a mass of a kilogram here, say one kilogram there, and it's in Earth's gravity, and the acceleration of, of an object, if you drop an object near Earth's surface, it will accelerate at 9.8 meters per second per second. It's got a fancy, it's actually called G. So 9.8 meters per second per second is acceleration. So the force is one <coughs> newton. Okay. So one newton equals one kilogram meters per second squared. Those are equivalent units. In case you have to make a conversion, you, you need to uh, put a, a value of newtons into a formula, but you, the formula also has some kilograms in there, maybe it's got a meter over here, and you need to know this equivalent so you can cancel some units if possible or multiply them together. Uh, okay, so there is a difference between mass and weight. I'd, I'd still be, um, I don't know what, uh, let's see if I'm 200 pounds, that's about 90, between 90 and 95 kilograms, roughly. So I'd still be 95 kilograms on the surface of the moon. But if I'm 200 pounds, I'd only be about 35 pounds on the moon. There's a difference in force there versus mass. Okay. Uh, uncertainty. Let's see. Yeah, I skipped one. Uncertainty. Anytime you make a measurement, anytime, every time, your measurement is uncertain at one level or another. It could be a huge uncertainty, or it could be a very small uncertainty. But we need a method to communicate that uncertainty among scientists. And one way is the, um, 
when you write the number, it's understood that um, 0.47502. If I wrote that number, what is that? 475,032 and whatever units it happens to be. Well, let's be consistent, maybe it's meters. When I write that number, any scientist that reads that number understands implicitly that these numbers I'm claiming are certain. There is absolutely no error in those numbers. At the level of hundred thousands, ten thousands, thousands, hundreds, and tens. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, and tens. But the ones unit, that's the uncertain one. In this number, the last one to the right is the uncertain number. Uh, another way to put it, it's a guess. You try to make a good guess, but it's still a guess. Now, if you're going to act, this is an example of actually making a measurement in the lab using this device called a burette. Notice it's, it's not like a graduated cylinder that's measured from um, bottom to top. The bottom, a graduated cylinder would be like 10 mils, 20 mils, 30 mils, 40 mils. Like a burette measures in the other direction because it's designed to deliver. Yeah, we've got some uh, rats in the belfry. It's measured in the other direction because it's designed to deliver a certain volume. So it measures smaller numbers from the top, larger at the bottom. So if you start on zero up here, if you have your fluid in there at zero, then you deliver a certain amount and then you can read exactly how much you delivered off the scale. But you got to remember that you're reading in the other direction. So it gets bigger this direction. That means this is not 20 and 19 down here. This is 20 and 21s down there. So we're saying that that level is actually Let's see. You know, that picture doesn't jive with this one. I just noticed that. There's 20, and there's 20, and the level is below it. <laughs> it just dawned on me. Okay, so let's focus on this one. <laughs> so below 20 would be uh, 19. So that means there should be, hey, walk more softly. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and there's nine tenths down to 21. So that means this is a tenth right here. So it'd be 20.1. It's not 0.2, and it's not 0.1, it's in between. So 0.1 and say whatever that estimate is, and I just, for argument's sake, call it five. So 20.15. And the five is a guess. There's no mark in there for the five. These marks uh, indicate certainty. So uh, when we write that number, the uncertain digit is the five. All right. Oh, another thing. When you're using glassware and your solution is aqueous, which is for our purposes, everything, uh, they always form a meniscus, this curve in the top of the solution. And they're calibrated to be read at the bottom of the meniscus, okay. just as a point of order. Okay, what's the difference between accuracy and precision? Well, if you talk to anybody in the media, they're the same, or a lawyer or a politician. <laughs> I, I won't be too hard on the lawyers. Some lawyers actually understand what that means. <clears throat> Uh, but there is a difference, especially for scientists, between accuracy and precision. Accuracy is a measure of how close your measurement is to either the true value, if you know it, or an accepted value. I used to work with uh, uh, state soil testing labs all over the, the southeastern United States. We had a working group, and we would exchange standard samples. So we have one sample that one lab would generate and make uniform mixing and all this uh, soil sample, send out samples to all the labs, and they'd all analyze it with their methods. And we compare methods and see what, what numbers we got. 
Well, we didn't know what the true value should be. So we had to agree on an accepted value. So we would take everybody's results and the average value would be the accepted value. And then any deviation from that was a deviation in accuracy from the accepted value. Precision, you can do precision without any knowledge of where the true value is. All you need is two or more measurements and you compare them. Are they close to one another? Or are they far apart? I know that's a subjective term, but that's the best we can do. So what does that look like? For a dartboard, <laughs> this one, uh, the average value of all these darts is gonna be right in here somewhere. That's nowhere near the bullseye. So that one is not accurate. And they're kind of spread out too. So it's not precise either. So it's not accurate, it's not precise. This one has a, a good grouping, right? But it's nowhere near the bullseye. So that's not accurate, but it is reasonably precise because of the grouping. This one is what you want. You got a tight grouping of your multiple measures and they're the average value is right on the bullseye. And if you're a hunter, that's what you want when you zero in your scope at whatever distance you're 100, 200, 300 yards, whatever it happens to be. And what you usually get, if your rifle's been in storage, you know, for several months, you pull it out, you want to zero in the scope, and you shoot three shots and you say, all right, where did they land? Uh, okay, they usually land off the bullseye. And so you, uh, dope your scope a little bit and shoot three more and hopefully you got the same grouping but now it's on the bullseye so you're you're trying for accuracy and precision with your weapon oh we are missing one other possibility right it's either uh accurate or not accurate or precise and not precise that combination gives you four possibilities doesn't it i'm thinking back to math or combinations. So what's missing? Let's see, we got not, not, we got yes, no, we got yes, yes. So we should have no, yes. Not precise, but accurate. So what would that look like? Well, if the bullseye's here, maybe you got, uh, you got one of those here, you got one of those here, one over here, one over here. The average value is right there. That's accurate, but it's not precise. Okay, so <clears throat> we need a way, right? We've got, we've got fundamental units and agreed upon measures. Uh, we know when we look at a number, we know what the certain digits are and what the uncertain digits are, but we still don't know what to do with our numbers if we have to put them into a calculation. So that's what significant figures is all about. Keeping track of the, the valid uh, certain numbers so that when you do your calculation, the, the end product of your calculation, you can be honest about the accuracy and the precision that you can expect from it. So that's where the significant figures come in and we have rules for it. If your number has non-zero numbers, digits all the way through it, every one is significant. Now we have the placeholder question. What if there's a zero somewhere? Well, it depends on where the zero is. The zero is on the left, and there are no non-zero numbers out here in the way. But they're all to the left. Those zeros are not significant. These two are significant. And notice that decimal point is bracketed by two zeros. It has a zero on the left and whatever else it has on the right. That's proper. That's the way it should be written. If you're missing that zero right there, then it's wrong. Right. That's what I call an orphan decimal. Okay, so that only has two significant figures. This one is a captive zero. That zero is in there for a purpose. It's a placeholder for that position. So it has to be significant. So this one has four significant figures with that captive zero. Now, what happens if the zero is on the right? Well, it depends. Is there a decimal there, an explicit decimal? 
if there is a, an explicit decimal like here, then all of those zeros are significant. If it doesn't have a, uh, an explicit decimal, then that zero is not significant. So that begs the question, suppose I made the measurement and said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That zero is supposed to be significant. There you go. I just fixed that problem. Now it's got three significant figures. And then the last category is exact numbers. These have infinite significant figures, which means when you're doing a calculation, you can basically ignore them after the calculation is done and just use the other numbers to determine um, limitations. Okay, uh, we're going to focus on this type. These are equalities, and we use those to produce conversion factors. I'll show you how that's done if I don't over talk. But first, we need a way to handle very large and very small numbers. So in a nutshell, uh, exponential notation only requires that this part of the number, let's see, let's use, okay, we'll use 300. This part of the number is the coefficient. Okay, and the coefficient in the scientific notation must always be between one and 10. If you get to 10, then you go up to the next level. Uh, exponential notation, See, this was times that. Exponential notation could be this. Right? Scientific notation is a subcategory. It's more stringent. This number always has to be between 1 and 10 for exponential notation. OK, and what are we doing? Well, we're moving the decimal. And every time we move the decimal, we store information in the, the power of 10. We move it to the left, we're making the coefficient smaller. So that means the power of 10 has to be bigger because the um, standard notation and the exponential notation or the scientific notation must agree. They have to be equivalent. So that means if you move the decimal to the left, make this part of the number smaller, that part has to get bigger. That's why it's positive. But if you move to the right, Say it's a, a fractional number, 0 0.00345. 0 Move it to the right, you're storing up, you're making your coefficient bigger. So the power of 10 has to be smaller, which makes it negative. Okay. Uh, the main two advantages are that uh, actually you can, it's more convenient notation for very large or very small numbers. But also, if you do it right, it's easier to detect for very large or very small numbers. It's easier to determine what the significant figures are because you only have to look at the coefficient. The exponent doesn't matter. Um, okay. So now that we've determined how many significant figures are in our number, what does that have to do with calculations? Well, there are two types of calculations that use significant figures to determine what's legal on the uh, uh, solution end. One is multiplication and division. Right? That's the easy one. You just look at your the multiplied numbers or divided numbers and look and see which one has the smallest number of significant figures. That's the limit on your answer. So you only have two here, that means your answer can only have two. But in order to minimize rounding errors, if you've got a calculation that has several multiplications and divisions in it, but no additions and subtractions, that's a special case. If they're all multiplication and division, do the whole thing till the end and keep every decimal point you can, all the way to the end. And then go back and say, all right, what's the smallest one? Then round your final answer. If you round at every step, uh, every step could be round up, round up, round up. <laughs> so your answer would be way off. 
Uh, so we also need a rule for rounding though. If this is the answer that comes out of your calculator, then you can only keep two. So you can have this one and you can have that one. Where do you go for the information to round? The first one to the right of that position. Eight is five or bigger. That's the rule we're using. It's, it's the rule of fives. Five or bigger, we round this one up and throw everything else out. Okay. All right. Now, addition and subtraction is a little bit different. You line up the decimal point, or you line up the imaginary decimal point. Right? Remember, we had some numbers that we knew there was a decimal there, but it wasn't explicit. So you, you line them up, and then you add everything together, and then you say, all right, which one has the fewest decimals? This one right here. So you're limited to that position. So that means down here, we have to round to that place, which means that becomes eight and the five goes away. Okay. What if we had uh, two, three, four, zero, and one, two, three? Add those together. Three, six, four, two. Right? So where do you draw the line here? Well, that's not significant, is it? There's no decimal. So we round to this position. That's three. So this one stays six. And we need a placeholder for that position. Otherwise, it doesn't mean the same thing. So we have to put a zero there. And that says, now this one has three significant figures. That one had three, and this one had three. It's a coincidence. Your answer has three. It doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes you can have five up here, two there, and have three in the answer. So when you're doing calculations that have a mix of these, you need to know what's the order of calculation. If you've got parentheses in your calculation that tell you the order, that's great. But if you don't, then what do you fall back on? For math, the order of operation. Parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, add, subtract, in that order. If the, if the equation or the calculation doesn't tell you what to do, then you use PEMDAS. And if you've got um, addition and subtraction in there, right, it's going to come last. If, if, it's not, if it doesn't tell you what to do, then that comes last. So you do all your multiply divide. An exponent is a, is a type of multiply divide, so it fits into this rule. And then you do add subtract at the end. So in that case, it probably it would take uh, at least two steps to do a, a complex calculation like that and get the correct number of significant figures at the end. I think the review document has a couple of those in it, just to see. We can get your head spinning good. All right. I think I'm about out of time. Right? 45. I got three minutes. <laughs> okay. So I'll make this short. In the laboratory, if you're doing, uh, say, measuring volume in this case, you're limited by the least accurate instrument in the series. So this one is the least accurate. Right, because these divisions are two tenths, and over here they're two hundredths. So that determines, you know, what you can keep in the end. Okay, problem solving is really very simple. When you're presented with a problem or with a, a word problem, a test question or something, first of all, well, you can read it through, of course, and then you ask yourself. What's the question? What is this thing asking for? That's the first law of logic. If you don't know what the question is, you can't get the answer. <laughs> so focus on the question first. Once you know the question, then you devise a way to answer the question. And you look in your uh, in the word problem, for instance, for the information that you'll need to solve it. You don't just uh, take the numbers that are given and shoehorn them into what you remember. That's, that's a guarantee for failure. 
And I'll tell you a story if I had time, but I don't have time. Dimensional analysis. This is a, a fancy word for keep track of your units and unit conversions. If we're going to convert one unit of measure into another unit of measure, there needs to be an equivalence, some way that relates the two units. Okay. Um, and you derive your uh, conversion factor from that equivalence. So if I say one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters, that's the beginning of a conversion factor. Say if I want to convert 25.4 centimeters to inches, right? I need something to multiply it by that will give me inches. So in math, you can multiply something by one. That's legal. You can, you can buy one times one times one times one, okay? So with that in mind, what if we need centimeters down here to cancel, don't we? Because that's over one. Centimeters to cancel, we want centimeters in the bottom. So let's divide through by centi the centimeter value, 2.54 centimeters on this side and 2.54 on this side, okay? We can do that, that's legal. Divide by the same value on both sides, haven't changed it. What's this? That's equal to one. All right. So if we can put a one here, then we'll substitute this because that's equal to one. So this goes right in here. 2.54 centimeters, one inch. Then the centimeters cancel. 2.54 to 25.4 is 10. Well, three significant figures, right? So it's 10.0 inches. Well, that's where conversion factors come from. And that's why they work, because all conversion factors are equal to one. And you can chain them together. Say if you want to get the centimeters to something else out here, miles, right? You can convert that to inches, and then you know inches you can convert to feet, and then 5,280 feet in a mile, convert that to miles, there you go. So you can chain them together. And maybe I've got an example here, I don't know. That's a simple example there. Very simple sample example. And this one is multiple factors, right? Go from pounds to grams. First, we convert pounds to kilograms. So we're going from the English system to the metric system first. And then we take the metric system on its merry way to the unit that we want. Okay. And uh, like I said before, it's, it's also good to estimate, right? You see a series of numbers that you're calculating. You say, okay, uh, let's see. In the top, I'm multiplying this times this times this, and that's about this number. And then I'm multiplying the bottoms this much, uh, and then divide that into that and say, okay. In the ballpark, this, I have a number in mind. And I look at the answer my calculator gives me close enough, you know, I'm good to go. It tells me if I, if I really made a big a whopping mistake. <laughs> uh, temperature, we talked about temperature earlier, what, how to get Kelvin out of Celsius. If you want to convert, I, I don't have time to talk about the history of these guys, but if you want to convert, here's your, your formula. Fahrenheit temperature is equal to Celsius temperature times nine fifths. Your book might say 1.8, but nine divided by five is 1.8. And then plus 32. Why do we need to do that? Well, first of all, Celsius and Fahrenheit have different zeros. So you got to make the zeros match up first. And then the units are different size. So now you have to change the units. So that's what this is. That makes the units match up. And this makes the zero point match up. And then, of course, for Kelvin, you just add 273 plus Celsius and you get Kelvin. We're not going to use the 0.15. This 273 is good enough. Okay, so, um, oh, it's, this is curious. Uh, is it possible, I mean, is there a number where the value for Fahrenheit is equal to the value of centigrade or Celsius? Like such a value, centigrade degrees would be equal to, yeah, as a matter of fact, there are, there is. How do you do it? Well, you take this formula and say, okay, if that temperature is supposed to be equal to this temperature, just call it X. 
call it X and solve for X. It turns out that minus 40 degrees Celsius is equal to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I know what that feels like too. I used to work for a company in month, every month we do inventory. And I was a low man on the totem pole, so I got to go into the blast freezer and do the inventory in there. That was minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So 10 minutes is all about all I could stand. I come out, warm up, and then go back in. Okay, this just illustrates uh, the use of units, right? If this is in grams and this is in cubic centimeters, then density has to be grams per cubic centimeter, right? The units are divided over here, and the density is a uh, division of the units as well as the number. This is for solids, and this is what we usually do for liquids, grams, and the volume is in milliliters. And this also illustrates that you have a formula with three variables, density, mass, volume. If you know two of those, you can solve for the third one. That's true of any equation. If you have one equation and only one unknown, you can solve it. It gets kind of tricky when you have an equation in two unknowns. Then you need two related equations to do that. <laughs> but we're not going to do that. <laughs> All of our equations have one unknown. You just have to decide which one is the unknown. Okay, so that's what that illustrates. Um, we we'll classify matter as solid, liquid, or gas. Everybody knows about that. Um, solid, definite form, definite volume. Liquids, definite volume, but not definite form, and gases, neither. And that dictates what kind of container. Uh, solids don't need a container. Liquids need a container, but it doesn't have to be. It can be open. But gases need a closed container. Uh, okay, so I'm running out of time. I got to finish this. So if you have to go, you know, and I'll I'll post the video. It looks like it's, it's legible. Homogeneous mixtures are those where you put two substances together, and these are physical actions. Where you put two substances together, they don't react, they retain their identities. And if they're uniform throughout the mixture, it's homogeneous. The same amount of each one relative to the other one, all the way through the mixture, it's homogeneous. That's also called a solution. Heterogeneous, the ratio of components is different everywhere you look. That's like soils. They're heterogeneous mixtures. Okay. Um, so we're not going to guess about these. Gasoline is the only homogeneous mixture in there. It's a solution. Oh, by the way, um, that's not a mixture. That's a pure substance. That's a pure substance. So you can throw those out first. Right, work your problem backwards. Which are mixtures? Right, right. These first, these three. Now you can think about homogeneous problem solving technique. Eliminate the obvious wrong answers. Uh, physical changes. All the components retain their identity. There, there are no new substances uh, with a physical change. Chemical change, on the other hand, produces new substances with new identities. So methane gas in the Bunsen burner in the lab takes uh, from natural gas pipe and mixes it with oxygen, you know, sets it off and it changes carbon dioxide and water. So you get two new substances out of these two original substances. That's a chemical change. All right. And this is straight out of your book. You know, if you like flow charts, you're welcome to them. I used to use them occasionally, especially if I had a very complex laboratory procedure to do. I would I would draw a flow chart so I'd know when this was supposed to happen relative to something else. It, it's helpful occasionally. If you do it often enough, then you can you can do it in your sleep. Okay, so um, when are we coming back? Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday we'll cover chapter. Two and three, I think. I believe that's it. And you can start to work on those extra credits whenever you feel comfortable. Um, you need some colored pencils for one of them, like this one, because you got to fill in this periodic chart. 
go back here. Using these instructions. Uh, and name compounds. Right? It gives you practice naming compounds. We're going to talk about those next week. And then introduction graphing techniques. We didn't have time to talk about this. But there's a lot of reading material in the front. And uh, this is an informal lab. So that's why the questions have points assigned to it. So when you fill it out here, I just grade it right here. This is not this is an informal report. And if you have any questions, you know how to contact us. And I guess we can shut this down.